Hi everyone, my name is Miklos Balint. Uh, I'm part of the Trusted Firmware M project and uh, I will be talking about uh, <coughs> the core and the uh, partition manager components within that in details uh, after some overview and, and, and some specifics of, of the platform we are uh, targeting with, with the first iteration of this uh, uh, project. Um, yeah. So, uh, as I mentioned, I will do a quick overview of the, the project itself. Uh, James uh, did a, a good overview of, of, of trusted firmware uh, before lunch and uh, we're just building on top of that, so I won't be giving you a, another overview of PSA, which is the foundation, but I will just give you a quick overview. I will explain uh, for the uninitiated uh, the fundamentals of Trust Zone for ARM V8M. Uh, the reason for that is our primary tar target is, is V8M uh, architecture. And uh, after that, I, I will go into uh, details of, of, of the core and partition manager uh, components within Trusted Firmware M. So, overview. Uh, PSA were, had a public launch uh, late last year and uh, engineering work of course started uh, earlier on that and uh, uh, PSA is a set of specs and uh, implementation I, the implementation is planning a, a reference implementation for PSA is planned to be uh, trusted firmware M or TFM in short uh, <coughs> as uh, again referring back to James uh, James's presentation uh, it's a it's an evolution uh, I will try to highlight where we are and where we are going with that this year. So, PSA and TFM. Uh, PSA uh, is an architecture definition addressing security requirements for a range of platforms. It is uh, a platform independent definition. It, uh, it focuses on the security requirements and uh, uh, there are no implementation details it allows for various implementations uh, and uh, of course it it's the aim is for it to be generic uh, across all arm architectures eventually uh, it's at the start of that road and and uh, the first uh, the first iteration focuses on M class due to vari various reasons uh, and uh, we are aiming to provide a reference implementation of PSA for M-Class CPUs uh, because none currently exist uh, in that space. We are covering PSA uh, specification requirements. Uh, the goal is for to focus on uh, details and to provide a usable implementation uh, the first uh, iteration is PSA level one isolation. I will explain what that means uh, in particular, but it means a simple isolation of the secure and non-secure domains. Uh, and uh, we set the scope for an ARM V8M mainline and baseline implementation for Trusted Firmware M. Uh, of course, there's an incremental support for higher isolation profiles and long-term plan for addressing other cores as well. So, uh, TFM framework. Uh, TFM framework is, uh, it includes a lot of things. Uh, it includes a secure bootloader. It includes a secure system initialization. Uh, it includes a partition manager that manages secure partitions and a non-secure partition. Uh, the intention is for it to contain some root of trust services and functions. Uh, 
uh, non-secure APIs, uh, build environment, test suite, and a host of other things uh, that will make life easier. So it's, it's, it is uh, a framework that encompasses a lot of things. Uh, but of course, uh, as any project, we have to start somewhere. And uh, we couldn't take on the whole of PSA, the whole architecture, in, a fir in, in one go, because uh, that's too large a scope. And it's actually a scope that's still evolving. And it will always be evolving, because that's how security is. So uh, we made uh, some very uh, stringent restrictions in the first prototype round, uh, just to have something working. Uh, and the first restriction it was that uh, we made uh, the secure processing environment non-reentrant, uh, which practically means that uh, one secure function is being serviced at a time, so there's no preemption within the secure uh, processing environment. Uh, initially, uh, we are also deprioritizing, deprioritizing all non-secure functionality while executing a, a secure function and this is to uh, limit the, uh, the the scope of, of, of uh, attack vectors that we the threat model basically to, to, to limit the threat model space that, that we have to investigate uh, we are of course working on on loosening that requirement but uh, it's it's a it's a this was a first assumption that we made. Uh, another constraint that we made is that uh, a secure partition, uh, which is described in PSA as a as a um, standalone execution thread, we actually defined it as a set of secure functions, uh, a library of secure functions that uh, don't have a, a, a state as such. Uh, and 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 it's not threaded in the classical sense. You don't have the the infinite loop and 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 such things. Uh, as a first target, uh, we don't have uh, sandboxing within the secure execution environment, uh, and which is equivalent to PSA level one isolation. And uh, one specific target uh, that we set was that. Uh, we have to make uh, TFM uh, non-secure OS agnostic, which means that uh, we don't want to set expectations on what's running on the non-secure side. We, we want uh, that to be uh, customer-specific, application-specific, requirement-specific. Uh, it can be bare metal, it can be an RTOS, uh, and uh, we we have of course investigated several specifics, but uh, the framework itself is aiming to be agnostic. We are focusing on V8M. Uh, why? Because it has a good set of security features, and we wanted to trial all of those and and provide a reference implementation for Trust Zone for V8M, which is also. Uh, waiting to be uh, used in such a scenario uh, in, a, in a comprehensive solution. And we are trying to do that. Uh, yes, as I mentioned, we want a whole working solution, which includes a, a, a reference implementation, a reference <coughs> uh, secure service, a secure uh, partition, uh, a secure storage solution, which has a non-secure uh, uh, processing environment API, uh, and uh, we also have a bootloader uh, implementation which roughly corresponds to BL2 in the A-class uh, devices, in the A-class trusted firmware solution. Uh, these last two items will be discussed in their separate sessions later. So, an overview of uh, Trust Zone for V8M. Uh, I'm doing this uh, with the assumption that uh, most people are, if they are familiar with Trust Zone, they are familiar with Trust Zone for A-class and, and perhaps not so much uh, for M-class 
so it's it's good to have an overview. Uh, ARMv8 um, architecture includes an optional security extension. It's branded as Trust Zone for V8M. Uh, it's a similar concept. It's, it has a similar purpose as uh, Trust Zone for A class, but due to the uh, specifics and, and, and differences in M class versus A class, uh, the, there have to be some differences in, in the way it's implemented, in, in, in the way it's adjusted to the hardware specifics. But the goal is the same, to provide secure software that is highly trusted. Uh, secure software has access to more hardware resources, system resources, and it is protected from access from non-trusted code. Uh, and, and, and memory and, and uh, execution state are isolated. So uh, the V8M security extension provides two security domains for the code to run in, secure and non-secure. And uh, <coughs> hardware, so it's very important to understand that hardware isolation is the foundation of trusted firmware as it, is, as it has to be the foundation of any isolation model. Uh, the debugger can be blocked uh, from accessing a secure state. Uh, hardware uh, accesses have to be uh, controlled in security state. And uh, we have to duplicate resources so that uh, the non-secure environment uh, doesn't feel restricted from a generic use case point of view. And uh, the baseline for that is the ARMv7M. Uh, which has two execution states, uh, application code is run in thread mode and there's an exception code which is run in handler mode. Uh, there can be two stacks uh, used and uh, this has to be extended for s to provide a security model and so V8M introduced new states uh, basically mirroring uh, both execution states in a non-secure and a secure uh, version. So now we have uh, four uh, possible execution states, non-secure thread mode, non-secure handler mode, and secure thread mode, secure handler mode. And the uh, stack pointer can be any of four <coughs> possible uh, stack pointers. So, so we, we can have four concurrent uh, contexts running on the CPU. Uh, uh, in addition to these new states introduced, there are some resources duplicated to allow for uh, 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 context switching between, state switching between secure and non-secure, so dedicated resources are provided, like memory protection units are, are banked between the two states, there's a non-secure MPU and a secure MPU. Uh, they have their own SysTick and uh, of course uh, the secure domain can uh, configure whether a particular interrupt is associated with secure state or non-secure state. Uh, calling between security states uh, was designed to be low latency low overhead, uh, uh, you know, this is different from A class because in A class uh, security state switching is always as associated with exception levels and, and, and exception handling. Uh, here uh, it was made easier, designed to be easier in hardware with simple function calls either uh, in the in thread mode directly or in exception mode a simple function called from non-secure uh, handler mode would result in under specific circumstances executing in secure handler mode. Uh, of course, uh, several restrictions apply uh, to make uh, the transition safe and secure. So only a subset of the secure code is callable from non-secure. 
there are specific uh, there is one specific instruction in the CPU that's a secure gateway instruction uh, and that's the only entry point permitted to be called from non-secure and uh, another important aspect is that the non-secure code does not need to be aware that it's calling a secure function so it can be wholly transparent from the non-secure application point of view. Uh, it's very important to note that uh, while in A class uh, there is a memory management unit, virtual memory address spaces can be defined, there is no MMU in M class, we have a, only a memory protection unit, uh, so basically all security definitions are mapped to the address space. We have a set address space and every memory address can be associated with one of three possible attributes, either non-secure or secure, and within secure it can be non-secure callable. So uh, every call from the non-secure domain has to land in non-secure callable secure memory address uh, and from then it can branch into secure memory while the return path is simpler. The whole memory is divided into uh, secure and non-secure uh, ranges uh, so every memory address has <coughs> one of the attributes, either secure, non-secure, callable, secure, or non-secure attribute. And uh, there are two uh, components in the, one component in the core and one component outside the core, which define uh, and, <coughs> and uh, the, the memory address associations. And uh, always, there are two components, always the strictest uh, attribute applies. Of course, the security uh, attributes have to be extended to the whole system. Uh, we want to be able to control multiple masters. Some might not be uh, security aware. Uh, trust zone also includes system IP to handle those kinds of scenarios, but I won't go into details of each and every one of those. And for example, there is a reference uh, implementation in the core link SSE 200 uh, subsystem where all of these uh, uh, master side and slave side trust zone components can be observed. Are there any questions to uh, VATM? security extension. Okay, then we can come back to that at the end if needed, but then I will proceed. So, uh, about TFM core and uh, partition manager. So, uh, this diagram uh, shows uh, an overview of the runtime environment uh, in the way we modeled it in trusted firmware. This is trusted firmware M. This is highly similar to uh, the PSA definition. We have, uh, <coughs> we have our own uh, matching names and, 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 and components. Uh, of course, the bootloader is not included because this is the runtime uh, view of the system and, and TFM core has uh, several features, basic features that it has to provide a secure system in it, uh, secure function call routing, so, so uh, it has to be involved in the transition from non-secure to secure uh, domain, and it has a partition manager which governs uh, isolation between uh, partitions both the non-secure partition and the secure partitions potentially. Uh, so we are enforcing isolation as well. There are uh, some components uh, which 
will be planned to be part of the FM core, but are not ready yet. So it's, as I mentioned, it's a work in progress. Uh, scheduling between secure partitions, uh, secure isolation for, for, for higher levels of isolation when secure partitions are isolated from one another, uh, crash handling, drivers, IRQ handling. There's a host of functions uh, that uh, are in the works or, or, or need to be in the works and, and which will be, are planned to be implemented later. So let's go through uh, an example use case uh, so that I can showcase how uh, TFM uh, defines a, a, a secure call handling routing. Uh, and, and it's a quite simple use case. Let's say we have a sensor, we have an application monitoring that sensor, and it wants, uh, it uses an IP stack to send the sensor data over an encrypted channel, a TLS uh, connection to a remote server. Uh, now, of course, uh, TLS provides encryption of the IP stream. Uh, it uses a secure crypto service uh, uh, to, to provide encryption and decryption of the communication channel. And that is because uh, we want to use a, a secret, uh, we want to use credentials stored in the secure domain uh, for that communication and we don't we want to provide all the security attributes needed for such a channel and so what happens uh, and we go gra gradually step by step through all of the isolation boundaries in the system so we have a non-secure thread uh, pulling the sensor it wants to and we have a non-secure thread, uh, one initiating the IP communication. So it wants to call crypto service to encode a packet, for example. It has to call the non-secure OS and within that the TFM library, uh, which is in non-secure handler mode, uh, which provides a lock for uh, the non-secure side this is to ensure uh, what I mentioned previously that we are only serving a single uh, uh, s request for a secure function at a time. So, so these two locks provide a, a one at a time service for, for non-secure requests. Uh, the TFM library on the non-secure side calls a secure privileged handler that uh, locks a non-blocking lock, uh, it saves the non-secure context. Of course, it performs a, a sanity check on the request, so it, it checks the, uh, the validity of the request. Uh, it sets up the secure partition context. It disables non-secure processing environment, uh, and then uh, it uh, executes a secure partition, secure function uh, in a privileged or unprivileged thread depending on the isolation level. Uh, so eventually the crypto operation is performed. On the return path, it's quite simple. Uh, the crypto service fills the return buffer with the encoded uh, IP uh, packet uh, it uh, returns to the TFM core uh, component in secure handler mode, which saves the secure partition context for the crypto service. Uh, it restores the non-secure context, unlocks the lock, and enables uh, the non-secure processing environment. And of course, going all the way back, uh, we unwind everything until the non-secure thread can then uh, send via its IP stack uh, the the message to the uh, remote server. Now the how, more details of the how we do uh, the isolation between the the components. This is uh, what I've talked about before. These are the 
This is the memory layout or address space layout provided by V8M. And we are <coughs> utilizing this as the baseline for, uh, for uh, defining uh, the various uh, address spaces that TFM is using. And uh, so for a, a PSA level one isolation, this is an example address space layout. You don't need to need read everything on the right side. I, I just uh, wanted to highlight that we have a, a non-secure address space. We have a secure address space with some non-secure callable uh, ranges. And then, of course, in the, in the data segment on, in, a, in an SROM, we have also non-secure and secure. What we all also need to control is peripheral access. Uh, so again, non-secure and secure peripherals need to be predefined and, and uh, TFM core has to set up the right uh, access policies for peripherals as well. So partition manager has to uh, create and maintain a database of all the secure partitions that we're supporting in a, in a particular system. It has to set up the isolation boundaries. Uh, in this case, uh, a single isolation boundary be uh, between non-secure and secure. Address space ranges. Uh, it has to prepare the, the execution context for a secure partition during a function call. And uh, in case of asynchronous events, which we don't support yet, but are, uh, we don't have support released for those yet, but we are, it's a work in progress. In case of asynchronous events in the system, we have to keep track of uh, uh, states of, of, of various components, various partitions in the system. And of course, uh, partition manager relies on V8M trust zone components to provide uh, the isolation within the address space. Now, if uh, we, so PSA discusses multiple isolation profiles, is isolation levels, and uh, we have to be uh, aware of this, and TFM has to provide a, a solution for the, uh, each of them eventually. So level one uh, has a, 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 a use case in case of low-cost hardware uh, with all the components within the secure part, secure domain, the secure processing environment, uh, having mutual trust. Uh, this is true for quite many use cases, but not all use cases. So for example, <coughs> if, uh, as, as uh, again, as James uh, mentioned in his presentation before lunch, uh, there could be third party vendors that we want to use secure uh, partitions from, which provide some secure functions, but we don't want them to have unrestricted access to root of trust services and of course our core TFM. We want to have an additional isolation boundary that is a PSA level 2 isolation where root of trust is separated from all of the secure partitions within the secure processing environment. Uh, it's important to note that this is still a limited isolation because secure partitions are not separated from one another. If we go one step further, uh, level three provides more robustness, uh, in which case all uh, secure partitions are uh, isolated from one another and uh, except for potentially some root of trust uh, services which uh, make up the trusted compute base. Uh, so uh, how does that map to uh, our address space isolation? I've already shown you that uh, in the case of level one isolation, 
This is a, an example memory layout that trusted firmware M enforces on the system which the partition manager uses to create isolation boundaries. Now, uh, if we want to have a level two or level three isolation, we have to utilize a trust zone, but we have to use the secure MPU as well, the memory protection unit uh, in the secure domain. And in that case, the picture gets a bit compli more complicated. Uh, in this case, there is a finer, much finer granularity of access control required because we have several permission types. We have uh, the TFM uh, core components, internal components, which are trusted. They are derived from the root of trust bootloader. So uh, those are privileged, trusted, secure components. There are some, there's um, unprivileged, secure code, which is basically uh, the secure partition resources, which are not to be shared. In level three, they are not to be shared with uh, other secure partitions either. And there are some shared unprivileged resources which are accessible to all secure code. So there's a host of different uh, uh, configurations that need to be uh, addressed and, and, and which need to be controlled by the secure partition manager. And due to the complexity of this uh, problem, uh, it's much harder to verify the security attributes of the partition manager in level two or level three isolation. So as I mentioned, this is why it's a work in progress. We do have a prototype which works under certain circumstances, <laughs> but, but there's a lot of work that needs to be uh, put into that to, to, to provide a, a reliable and, and, and a truly secure solution for, for, for a high level of isolation. So uh, what are the plans for TFM core and, and the partition manager? As I mentioned, uh, preemption uh, by the non-secure environment is quite a critical uh, expectation, which should be there for most use cases. Uh, it's as simple as being uh, responsive to a non-secure low latency requirement interrupt in the system, which we are currently not prepared to handle. Secure IRQ handling, which is an asynchronous event handling on the secure side. That's another uh, uh, feature that is uh, quite, that can be quite common, if, especially if we are relying on hardware, secure hardware accelerators, like a, like a crypto engine or, or any other secure peripheral. Uh, but that's uh, already a smaller, although still large subset of use cases. Uh, we are uh, looking at uh, all of the APIs currently provided by TFM. Uh, again, uh, as already mentioned earlier by James, TFM is not cur currently PSA compliant in all its APIs. So we, have, we are looking at all the possible uh, API solutions that could work for both low-end devices and can scale up to, to higher resource devices with a lot, of, uh, lot more stringent threat models. So we have to look at all the APIs and see if they scale uh, and, and how we can use the PSA definitions for those APIs. And uh, yes, so PSA alignment is uh, a big roadmap item for this year. Uh, we want to provide all the isolation prof profiles uh, defined in PSA. Uh, and uh, there are plans uh, 
to see how we can turn our library of secure functions, which, are, which is how we currently define secure partitions, and, uh, and look at the feasibility of turning them into execution threads, which quite likely suit a high so higher isolation profile better. But we, we are looking at all of these options at the moment. So, uh, any questions on that? Or maybe I will just take a summary and then we can go to questions. What we have right now, we have PSA level one isolation in the first release of the software. Uh, we have a framework for integrating secure services, secure partitions. We have a second stage bootloader and a sec secure storage service, which will be discussed in separate sessions. We have a build system. Uh, we have documentation. Uh, we do have uh, example ports of integrations with non-secure OSs, RTX, Embed OS, uh, FreeRTOS, and actually for Friday we are planning to demo a uh, Zephyr integration as well. Uh, so we, ha we have various demos, we have uh, uh, some test suits available, and we are looking for partner engagement at this stage. Uh, all of the uh, code uh, with the documentation, with the build system, with the uh, test suits available to the public uh, right now. Just a few words about uh, initial target support. Uh, we are supporting uh, Cortex M33 and M23 based systems. Uh, uh, which exist uh, as FPGA, FPGA implementations on MPS2 boards uh, as well as fast models of these very same MPS2 systems. Uh, so we have those uh, working right now with, with, with all the reference code we have. And uh, so high-level plans for all of the project align with PSA specifications provide standardized APIs for as many secure features as we can uh, to follow PSA specification for secure partition manager and for IPC mechanism described in PSA for initialization, boot and firmware upgrade, which is also a very important aspect. Uh, and. Uh, a host of build configurations for the entire system. Uh, we are planning to support uh, as many ARM reference platforms as we can. Uh, we are planning to support the Muscatest chip. Uh, it's actually the, at the prototyping stage. I, as I mentioned, we do support uh, the S SSC 200 FPGA for MPS2 and the F corresponding FVP, the first fast model for that, and uh, of course various system IPs, the crypto cell, the crypto island, uh, and uh, what we are looking for is, as I mentioned again, partner SOC support, uh, software integrations for OSs, RTOSs on the non-secure side, secure OSs, <coughs> The whole project is public in open source, so please get involved. This is the main message. Uh, we have the code base uh, uh, on trustedfirmware.org. We have a team uh, uh, at this Linaro Connect uh, with Abhishek, Ashutosh, Tamás, and myself. And uh, you can get, get in touch with us after the presentations this afternoon in the light hacking room, a dedicated time slot on Wednesday and schedule a meeting in Pathable, get in touch. And for any more information, uh, you can go to developer.arm.org. So thank you and please questions.
Uh, just a second, we'll get the mic. So in current stage, so uh, in first uh, slides we have uh, mentioned uh, it is a uh, last secure OS uh, agnostic. So how about for the secure OS? It is still secure OS agnostic or not? So secure OS uh, is uh, if we consider a secure OS. Uh, Abhishek? Yeah. <coughs> okay. So, yeah, um, it's slightly different from the A-class uh, world where you have independent uh, trusted operating systems. Uh, our plan is to provide complete um, execution environment where you don't need a different trusted um, operating system. The, what just Miklos presented it is, in, eff in effect, is the uh, trusted execution environment not maybe not fully functional operating system, but it in effect provides all the facilities you need for developing secure applications. Yeah. So is memory map uh, the same in secure and non-secure mode? Like a GPIO address of a GPIO block would be the same or can change between them? Uh, so, as, as I uh, mentioned uh, earlier, let me go back to one of the slides with the, with the memory map as defined for V8M. So, uh, the configuration for uh, the address space has a, a static component, which is defined at implementation time. Uh, CP MCU so RTL definition contains an initial uh, separation between some secure and non secure address ranges and that can be uh, uh, configured further with the software configurable uh, security attribution unit uh, as for the specific address of peripherals uh, it's, it's an implementation defined characteristic of the hard hardware, but uh, it makes all sense to have uh, a secure and a non-secure alias for the same peripheral. Uh, and uh, in that case, if the there is a so if uh, there is no need for the secure. Uh, trusted firmware to configure it secure because it's a peripheral that is not used for security purposes then it will just enable the non-secure code to access the non-secure alias for the peripheral so uh, so it can change the address of, of the address because of aliases right sorry it can change the addresses can change in secure and non-secure mode because of aliases yeah, so uh, it's it's going to be different for for the secure and non secure. It it has to be different because because all of this mapping is uh, ideally static. If 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 we want to change it in runtime, that will be a lot of overhead. Uh, so we are trying to avoid that. And and this is for example something that we encountered uh, on the get go when when porting. Uh, V7M Zephyr implementation on V8M platform that all the addresses had to be set correctly to the non secure alias of the peripherals, the default uh, peripherals for the subsystem. But just to add on this, there are certain memory regions which you cannot override. They're meant to be secure. So, one of the IPs that Nicolaj <coughs> mentioned is IDAO, that defines a static configuration of the memory. Um, so, it sets a bare minimum set of memory requirements, uh, security requirements on the memory. From that point, the security attribution can go only up, it can't go down. So if something is marked as secure only, it cannot be uh, re-enabled as non-secure access. It can only be secure. So in order to change the boundary, it's one device. There are two parts, one is security, one is non-security. In order to, to change the, the area of each part, you have to reboot your system. It was kind of static. 
So, uh, so basically, uh, the way uh, this should be thought about, the, the way I, I think about it is, uh, from the non-secure OS perspective, it has a restricted but static view of the system. So uh, we would uh, define, so uh, the OEM vendor, for example, if, if they want to deliver their product uh, with a trusted firmware M, uh, uh, root of trust uh, system, they would define what a non-secure application can access statically. So, so, so that the non-secure OS and the non-secure application as a whole would have a, a set of peripherals at predefined non-secure locations in the system. So, so it's, it, it's not a matter of restarting the system or, 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 or uh, it, it's a static configuration defined by the OEM, typically. So my my concern is we will, if we change some applications with some previous, uh, some applications previously used in security mode, now we want to shift it to non-secure non mode. That means we need to do some reconfiguration, right? That means this kind of reconfiguration has to be based on you reboot your your hardware, you reboot your device. And yeah, if we don't change that, everything was static, right? Um, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's the point I get from your presentation. Right? Yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty much. So, uh, but uh, uh, again, it's a, it's a matter of, of, of how you look at it and what the use case is, because yeah. there can be a use case where you, so you are allowed to, from the trusted firmware, dynamically reconfigure the memory map, uh, specific the parts of the memory there. map. But uh, in an embedded application, it's, I would say, uh, an unlikely or not typical scenario. Okay. We are running the code from Flash, uh, static components in the Flash. Uh, so if, if you do, for example, uh, uh, an upgrade and a new firmware, uh, would have a different uh, memory layout, you would anyway restart the system with the new configuration. Okay, got it. Thank you. I appreciate that. In, in terms of maintaining the root of trust, um, are you going to provide just callbacks and leave that to, to the vendors to, to provide the mechanisms of key management and, and authentication, or is that going to be part of the, the trusted firmware model itself? <coughs> I can take that. So that's slightly different from the framework. The one of the uh, root of trust services you need is the bootloader, the secure boot, that is handled by the secure boot, the BL2 that Miklos mentioned. Then when you talk about the runtime uh, root of trust services, for that you need services that can plug in into this framework, not the framework itself. So services like crypto and secure storage will provide you the root of trust in the runtime. So, so the answer is trusted firmware M will have something, but this particular is about the firmware framework. So um, if your answer is about the root of trust or attestation services, once PSA actually specifies what are the requirements, they will be implemented in trusted firmware M. The only abstractions will be about vendor specific hardware. So if you have a crypto accelerator hardware, at some point the line has to be drawn about where the, uh, where the driver is specific to a crypto hardware. But the software part of that service will be implemented in the project. Okay. And the question is, uh, uh, do you uh, want to depict some function which was provided by your trust firmware? Uh, the reason I mention this question is because I see some our, our videos from YouTube to depict some Google Nerf. It's kind of uh, another kind of uh, trust firmware, and as it clearly depicts some of features in Intel platform, it's not necessary for the firmware level. And as Google want to get rid of all of unnecessary features, has already existed in the UEFI. So uh, I'm not sure whether you have this kind of. Uh, momentum in the future to get rid of some 
uh, redundant function in firmware layer and to make the firmware the, the something but a little older, extremely uh, um, efficient and move some more, more complex function from firmware layer to upper system layer or some high level layer to make it more efficient. So uh, I would say that uh, that that we will have to wait and see what the the use cases will be provide what use cases will be provided. Uh, we are providing a reference implementation where we are trying to uh, set the watermark to the right level of what the framework provides and what we are uh, planning to have a planning to be hooked into it. But uh, we want it to scale. We want it to scale down to to a low footprint, highly efficient framework where all of the additional secure partitions, all of the functionality is plugged in by the vendor itself, the silicon partner or whoever wants to use the framework. Uh, and it want, we want to still provide a reference implementation to all the additional secure partitions, some, some reference trusted partitions, for example, as we now have the secure storage implementation, which is one possible implementation. But we already have uh, a user defines. So, um, so even currently the trusted firmware at build time, you can specify what is it that you would like in the final build and you can take out services or add services. And I think if you're talking about whether the framework provides that model or not, the build will provide the model. So you, you configure what the final build outcome you want. You take the services. If you're adding your own services from elsewhere, that's uh, that at that point you're taking a custom build out and you're building in some other environment outside just the firmware. Yeah, so uh, th this is this is very uh, specific, I think, to 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 M M class and 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 uh, and the trusted firmware M solution and in general the 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 embedded uh, mic microcontroller solutions that it's all statically defined at link time, what 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 the system provides and 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 what additional layers <coughs> you would want to add on top of that as separate. Raw libraries, for example, or the non-secure application. I okay, got it. One well, my last question will be: All of this presentation you depict here is only for ARM platform, right? It's only for ARM. If any other platform, maybe it's, it's not available for so, Intel or or PC and all of the rest of no. platform. This so um, not available. Th this implementation actually implements lots of bits of software which have the dependency of hardware in, in specific layers. We focus on, to start with, ARM V8 M systems. Beyond that, there are more different ARM M class processors. And if someone else would want to use the bits of software or anything else, I don't think there's a restriction. We are focusing on um, okay, ARM. That's, that's, the, that's the way I would put it. The code, is it BSD license three? Yeah. You can use it any way you want, in any kind of system. I mean, we would encourage that because that takes the PSA standards elsewhere. And would, would we appreciate uh, contributions from other platforms? That would be even better. <laughs> so we have a question there. Okay, uh, since you mentioned aliasing is possible, how do you make sure the same region is not aliased for both secure and non-secure? And what happens? How the how does the system behave if the same region is aliased for both secure and non-secure? Uh, that that's this is this is a a thirty-two bit uh, physical memory layout and and since since uh, the address is so so there's a single hardware association. It's it's uh, basically in in a in a single master. Uh, scenario, it's that's not possible because because the the hardware component doesn't allow for. To be honest, if there's a memory, it can be accessed from both sides yeah. at different aliases, and that's shared memory. Yeah, that's so so if you ha if you need shared memory, you're gonna have to map it on both sides. But if it's a peripheral which has states in the driver somewhere, mm -hmm. 
you don't want to map it to both sides. That's where trusted firmware M um, top level definition will ensure that it only goes to one side once when you build it. Okay, yeah, uh, that's my that's my question. How do you make sure that uh, that is not being shared across both? Sure, there are problems you do want to share. GPIO, you would want to share in both modes and have the bits protected. That's the level of granularity which we need to consider properly before we allow. Um, <laughs> Bitwise granularity is very difficult to implement in this space because the um, address space actually is accessed by 32 bit values. But uh, for peripherals, so in case of peripherals, there are problems if you map it to both sides, right? Yeah. So you don't, you, the, the question is not that. The question is how do you ensure that that's the purpose of secure firmware. So you, your secure firmware is the only one which can configure the system components. So non secure cannot change what's been set up. So once you once you have secure firmware has decided that something is not mapped to non-secure, non-secure can't access. Now if your secure firmware has got bugs or features which are mapping it in a way that it's going to break the system, that that's a problem. Not not basically, of, of that's that's the problem which is we are trying to address by putting software infrastructure that prevents as much as possible. But if someone goes and breaks that and says we're going to map it both sides, you're effectively on your own. Okay, uh, I think that's the last question we had time for. I'm, I, I would gladly uh, ask for questions later, sorry, but uh, we, we have to set up the, for the next presentation, which is also in, in the same topic. Thank you.